I'm Jim Straw. I'm the uh, chairman of the Young Voters for the President here at UCLA. And Okay. And uh, I would very much like to uh, thank you and welcome you here to come and hear Senator Buckley. Uh, for those of you who have more questions or would like to volunteer to do work for the President on Election Day, we have a uh, table in the back of the room. Now I'd like to uh, introduce a uh, very competent program director, Jeff Grunfeld. Jeff, yeah. The election, the election of James Buckley to the United States Senate from New York was one of the ironies of the 1970 election. Defeating both Republican and Democratic opponents, Buckley became the first candidate of New York ever to be elected to the Senate from a third party in 30 years. Born March 9, 1923 in New York City, he majored in English literature at Yale. After serving as a naval ROTC officer in World War II, Buckley graduated from Yale Law School in 1949. Although considered a member of the Nixon team, Senator Buckley voted against the Lockheed Loan Guarantee, claiming such government intervention <laughs> would erode free competition. Buckley also introduced legislation to cut off economic aid to any country which failed to take steps to halt the importation of drugs. <laughs> meaning narcotics. He has taken a special interest in problems concerning preservation of the natural environment. Clayton Dubois described him in the New York Times Magazine as possessing that kind of natural warmth and good humor Richard Nixon could only dream of. Would you join me in welcoming <laughs> Ms. Senator Buckley? This is a lavalier mic. We just attach it. Okay. Okay, let's hope this thing works. Fine. Well, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm especially delighted that this is going to be a, a question and answer format, because I think that that is the best way to uh, air views, get opinions, and uh, so on. Also, you can't duck the hard ones. But uh, I would like to unburden myself of uh, just a few general observations before we do get started. Uh, we have a, a terrible tendency in, in our society to, to categorize and oversimplify. We tend to uh, compartmentalize our population and then we indulge in all kinds of generalizations, out of which comes a, a stereotype. And I think that, uh, that young Americans have been among the greatest victims of this tendency, and I think it's unfair to the nation, but most particularly, it's terribly unfair to people in your generation. With, uh, I've, I was particularly struck by this phenomenon in my own campaign. I ran in 1970, and which was just in the aftermath of all of the uh, campus disorders uh, following the uh, Cambodian incursion. Uh, one of my comp opponents, Charlie Goodell, had uh, tried to capitalize on what was then called the youth movement, and his uh, sideburns came down two or three notches, and his uh, uh, cuffs uh, expanded out, and, and he would be it was in the forefront of um, all kind of protest movements and so on. Yet, as soon as we got organized, the press was astonished to see that I had more young men and women, uh, uh, high school and college age, working in my headquarters around the state than my two opponents combined, uh, <coughs> which led me to believe that the young people are pretty much like other people, that they have different points of view, different enthusiasms, different interests, and that it is uh, totally wrong to uh, try to put them in a neat, neat uh, uh, cubbyhole uh, or a neat mental picture. But what is it that young people do have? They are strong on energy. They are strong on idealism. <laughs> They are as yet unfettered, uh, unpreoccupied by, by the, uh, the business of the nine to five, the earning of a living, the family responsibilities, uh, which tends to close too many of our population and having them focus on, on their immediate activities. You, your horizons are open, your, your time is open. Uh, this is what's going for you. I think what you are short in, and it's nothing that, that uh, 
uh, can be blamed on anyone. It's just the natural process of thing, and that is experience. You just haven't been around enough years to build up that kind of body of uh, intuitive knowledge of the interaction of human beings, of situations and so on, which uh, 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 is part of, of, of the developing, maturing process. It's the reason why uh, a, a brilliant guy getting out of law school is going to be a better lawyer 10 years later than he is as he gets out of law school, simply because he has seen of his profession in operation. He has l gotten the basis on which to draw judgment. Now, I think that one area where society has, uh, in our country, is letting you down it has to do with that which gives you a substitute for experience uh, uh, as you develop your own life uh, uh, contacts. The, what I'm referring to specifically are those uh, uh, seats of, uh, of moral and ethical judgment, uh, which traditionally has been wrapped up in religion. Certainly, our great, uh, the great reservoirs uh, of, of uh, truths outside of, of human beings, outside of the human nature, uh, are, are at base uh, religious, uh, however you define religion, how you ever define God, but at least it's something that's beyond us as individuals. Each one of us needs that, every society needs that, it needs a goal. And to the extent that we are fracturing or, or underscoring uh, or uh, denigrating uh, these sources of, of, uh, uh, of uh, ethical value, to that extent, I think it makes it harder for people uh, growing up in America today to have firm moorings to be part of a continuing process. The other lack, I think, is that we seem to be downgrading history. And it is, after all, what history is, is uh, the recorded uh, uh, record of man's experience in trying to cope with the problems that hum humanity has, has, has had to face uh, uh, in, civilized, uh, in the civil uh, context of civilization from immemorial time. We're part of a continuum. Uh, none of us can start all over again in a vacuum without repeating all the mistakes that have gone before us. I think in particular, in this country, uh, uh, it is important to our understanding of our own system, our understanding of our governmental uh, system, economic system, to have some better understanding than many schools now give of exactly what it went into, f philosophically I'm talking about, in terms of, uh, of uh, the structure uh, of our government and our ideals. Now, I think we all share the same ideal, and that is uh, the achievement of a society which can nurture human freedom and which can give the, the maximum expression to that human freedom while having a cohesive society that just doesn't uh, uh, wander off into all kinds of, uh, which doesn't uh, degenerate into, into uh, uh, something unorganizable. Un, uh, uh, there is also, we believe in, in uh, equality of opportunity uh, the, the American dream or attempt uh, has been to achieve a society where each individual has the opportunity of making the most of what's within him, to take risks, uh, and if there is success, to enjoy the benefits of that success. Now, the, the, of course, this is, some, th this is nothing unique to the United States. What is unique to the United States, I believe, and th is that when our nation was put together, uh, it was done with an insight into human nature and into human history, which has uh, made it possible for something to be constructed, which has lasted as a free society longer than any other constitutional uh, 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 democracy uh, in re recorded history. We're an ancient, matured experiment. We're a continuing experiment, an ongoing experiment. But I do believe that uh, uh, without that historical base, it is much more difficult to understand the bases of our, of our institutions, to understand how best to correct them, how underst to understand how best to avoid repeating mistakes that have destroyed free societies in the past. So anyway, this is, uh, I have now uh, unloaded my observations as a whole. I think I've been exemplarily uh, unpartisan at this point. But this is a presidential campaign I am fr frankly here in, 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 the, in the connection with a last 
week tour of uh, California to, to do my bit for a team I believe in. And I now throw myself open to the, uh, to the wolves. <laughs> Yeah, you're talking about that, uh, what I believe to be a disgraceful uh, situation in that one school where 31 black kids have been frozen out day after day after day. Uh, I think this is something that nobody can be proud of. Uh, and I think, however, it is the sort of thing that we run the risk of stirring up when there is an attempt in the educational system to pursue a wholly theoretical objective that I think uh, has very little grounding in practical knowledge. The whole idea of busing to achieve a predetermined racial mix is that it em encourages good, ed good education, uh, educational opportunity, quality of that. I think that uh, among the results is that you, you uh, misdeploy, misdirect the resources available to education, and you have the opportunity of stirring up the worst in men, <laughs> as has occurred there. Is it, you were talking earlier about uh, morality coming from some place that. If the presidency has assumed a kind of role that a lot of people think it has, is kind of dispensing some kind of morality for, for being an object to look at for some kind of moral direction, <laughs> Can the kind of lack of morality that I see in the Nixon administration with the Watergate, with the grain deal, and a lot of these things, and kind of just, and back to Johnson too, who's a Democrat, and, and the credibility gaps and all that. But I think that that, is there some connection between that kind of, you know, eroding away of morality in, in places of leadership to the kind of just baseless or morally bankrupt actions of the, uh, white people in New York who were outstanding kids. Well, uh, you, you, you've uh, assumed uh, a certain things from uh, in terms of grain deals and, and uh, Watergate incidents, which I, which I won't concede, uh, that there is a, a command responsibility and command guilt. I, I just, uh, uh, <coughs> number one, there's no doubt that uh, at least seven people are, are, are uh, directly implied in an outrageous uh, uh, exercise in vandalism, of, uh, uh, illegal use of bugs, and so on. They have been subjected to the uh, grand jury procedure. A grand jury, proced a grand jury has the broadest possible uh, sources of inquiry. Uh, a, a total getting of evidence uh, under sealed doors uh, to do with, uh, under, under the uh, on the basis that this way you can get witnesses to, to tell all, and on, as a result of that, indictments have been let out. Uh, from a practical political point of view, more morality aside, and I think it, incidentally that moral uh, politics is good politics, but I, I, this strikes me, this uh, Watergate enterprise is something that was so totally irrational, so totally bound to be non-productive, that I, I cannot believe that the people that either at the top of re-elect or the people in, uh, or, the, or the president could, could possibly have had been involved in it. Well, now, what, beyond no. that, what about the grain deal? What about the I was uh, getting to the grain deal. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I think in the, in the, with a whole audience of this sort, uh, I'll, uh, we on, on the uh, grain deal, there is, frankly, I s I've examined the thing with uh, great care. I refer you to a magazine called National Review that had a whole, uh, <laughs> you know, question and answers. <laughs> but uh, there was, I think, it, uh, there was a lot of evidence of stupidity in terms of not understanding the implications of, of the huge, oh, uh, of the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Russians were able to cover up the extent of their demand. The fact is that sales were negotiated. There was, uh, they were negotiated at the then market price for export of, of, uh, of uh, U.S. Uh, grains under the same ground rules that uh, uh, apply to our exports of grain to other countries. Uh, the farming community uh, had as much knowledge as other communities that something was in the wind. They didn't know the size of it. 
the, there was no advance leak of the sort that could allow people to uh, profit and, and so on. What about the guy who used to work for Buzz, who works, who now works for Purina, and Purina ended up with most of the deal? I mean, that's just the empirical evidence there seems to... But I want to read the right part. <laughs> no, the, uh, the I think it's unfortunate that you had that thing because it gives rise to this kind of speculation. <laughs> but in the terms of the, uh, oh, but, uh, no. but in terms of the mechanics, in the terms of the mechanics of the negotiation, the, in terms of uh, the business, you there, you have brain middlemen the way you have uh, middlemen in in. Uh, in, in, any, in uh, anything else that is uh, a raw material. But the problem here is the grain middlemen are also the government middlemen. And that's what, that's what, that's what causes that this, uh, the whole controversy. Uh, no. On, honestly, the, the, uh, the, the, the cause and effect there just doesn't follow. It just doesn't follow. Well, all the same for magazines. <laughs> 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 Mr. Buckley, Richard Nixon claims to uh, espouse the work ethic and yet under his administration, the welfare roles and unemployment roles have drastically increased. Meanwhile, those of us who are working and are on the payrolls find our wages frozen or seriously controlled while our prices go up and up and up. Um, something seems inconsistent here about Mr. Nixon espousing the work ethic. I'm not sure that I follow the cause and effect there. But uh, I would say this, first of all, welfare roles have expanded enormously. Uh, and I think that this is an indication of the, in, of the inherent defects of, uh, uh, in the welfare system, especially a lot of the ground rules imposed by HEW that make it terribly difficult for states like California and New York to apply common sense uh, proposals to see that those who are in actual need are getting the help and those who could work are, are required to work uh, so as not jobs. Okay. Unemployment's well, awful high right about now. Okay, we're taking these things one at a time, right? They're related. Uh, number two, we've got an, an, an unemployment of 4.3 uh, million, I think, at, uh, at, the, at the present time, up from 2.5, I see the McGovern commercials, uh, from 2.5 uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, in the last three years, four years, we have had two things happen. One is that we have chopped our military by about a million. We've chopped defense-related jobs by, uh, by more than a million. At the same time, we've had the influx of the uh, World War II baby boom going into the employment market. Uh, we have, in fact, in the last year, added 2.4 million people to our labor force. Uh, that, uh, uh, give, given the retrenchment in, in the war situation, and given the uh, a, a, in, an unusual amount of accretion in our, our employment uh, roles, I think that we've done a remarkable job of digesting all, all the people. We've, got, we've never had so many people employed in the countries we have today, and we've never, uh, and at right now, we, uh, their uh, pay is buying more than it has in the I, past. No. I uh, question that. No. As a worker whose pay is buying less than it was a year ago and much less than it was three years ago. We're talking uh, on, on, uh, on the national averages, and I don't know what your particular situation I is. I with statistics. Okay. I don't know uh, anybody whose pay, any working man whose pay is buying more than it was one, two, or three years ago. Well, uh, perhaps the corporations with their I don't, I don't know, profits I don't, are. I don't know what the situation in, in uh, this county, and this is, of course, one of the areas where you have a pocket of I'm referring employment. to other parts of California and other parts of the country I'm talking well. about uh, New York. How's that? Uh, no, I'm talking <laughs> no. about California, well, the, 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 Georgia, uh, and national, Washington. The national figures are there. Uh, if you want to question statistics, uh, fine, but then show where they're at fault. The fact is that the average wage earner today is able to buy more than he was a year ago. Uh, now, in terms, you're talking about uh, wages being frozen uh, while prices go up. Uh, prices were going up at about six and uh, over 6% the time the president came in as a result of trying to fight a war and, uh, and to do all the uh, domestic things at, at the same time. 
the rate of inflation is now down to about, I'm talking in terms of the consumer, is down at about 3%. This, to my uh, way of thinking, is substantial uh, progress. Last month, last month it went up one half of 1% nationwide. That translates to an annual rate of 6%. These things have zigs and zags, and, and uh, maybe next month it'll be down. Uh, you have to take the uh, uh, meaningful blocks of time. And in point of fact, over the past 12 months, the, the increase has been in the, in the area of, of 3%. Uh, now the, the wage uh, uh, controls uh, uh, allow wage increases on the average. These things are all on the average of about a um, 5%. Uh, maybe your particular, where you're working, has, uh, uh, has not uh, uh, been carved in for that. Apparently not. But in point of fact, the, uh, the, the, what is allowed as a wage increase under these controls, which incidentally I don't like worth a darn, uh, it has uh, exceeded the, the rate of increase on consumer goods. Yes, sir. Um, oh, excuse me. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to UCLA. I think it's nice. We'd like to. Have, we need to have more people of your political philosophy here to discuss with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question really has to do deal with uh, your comments about experience. From about the time I was in the fourth grade, I started to learn about corruption in government, particularly at that time with uh, grant administration. And it seems like every year as I get older, I find out more and more about corruption that happened 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I'm to, in regards to this current re election, uh, I find that there are quite a few things that I'm a, I have fear for. For instance, in this country, it is permissible to, to forgive uh, Cali and not <coughs> do anything, for instance, for Angela Davis. Um, <coughs> for instance, uh, the, the Watergate issue of wiretapping. Three years ago, I was working for a company which was investigated by the FDA. Mm -hmm. And there was extensive wiretapping done. It was discovered. The FBI was called in. As soon as the FBI found out that the FDA was doing the wiretapping, all the evidence disappeared and nothing else was said. Uh, we have, for instance, in, in every election, there's usually, in every party, people criticizing the president over people who are being elected. There isn't a single major Republican candidate criticizing the Republican administration. I find this fearful. For instance, in Las Vegas, uh, every of the major powers in Las Vegas, they support Kennedy when he was running for president. They support Nixon when he's running for president. They support Governor Brown when he's running for governor. They support Governor Reagan when he's running for governor. And one final point is that this issue about where the money goes and taxation, every rich Republican candidate, especially dealing with with um, uh, Senator, Con I mean, uh, former uh, Secretary of Treasury Connolly and all the rich people. He's a Democrat. Okay, <laughs> that's right. But there are. There are a tremendous amount of people who have mo money and power who can go out and, and talk about welfare and civil rights and then turn right around and s not say anything about the fact that they're getting 50 or or $100,000 not to grow crops and then write it off for income tax and not pay a single penny. For instance, one of the major, Republic uh, major Republican supporters with uh, uh, John Wayne, he gets a fantastic amount of money from a government for doing nothing, and it doesn't pay very much income tax on the money he gets. And the same with Governor Reagan. What, really, what I'm trying to say is put it all together. What am I going to find out in 20 years when I'm more experienced? That's my, my whole setup. Well, I'm trying to formulate out of, out of, out of uh, uh, what you said a, a, a question that I can focus on. I'm not saying this in any, in, in, uh, in any kind of style ways. I think what you have expressed is, is important and uh, uh, expresses the kind of concerns that I think we've got to cope with. Uh, first of all, let's get at, at the business of the, the whole tax picture. 
the tax rules have been, and I hate to sort of use partisan labels, because, uh, but the fact is that the Congress of the United States has been controlled by the Democrats all, every year but four in the last 40. These tax uh, write-offs, uh, deductions, credits, and all the rest of it were put into the tax uh, uh, structure because the people at the time felt that they served legitimate needs and legitimate objectives uh, and uh, compensated for legitimate uh, business losses, risks, and the rest of it. Uh, I think that this, this uh, kind of a structure needs to be re-examined uh, periodically to make sure that the con changing conditions don't require changing treatment. But I don't, think, I don't think there's any reason to criticize someone as in any way morally bankrupt if he's, going by, uh, if he's following the, the Internal Revenue uh, uh, Code uh, to the letter, uh, utilizing uh, the provisions exactly as they were intended in, in, most, in most cases. Take, uh, take uh, your uh, tax exempts, for example. Uh, the uh, purpose there, number one, is a constitutional problem in terms of uh, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Number two, it was felt desirable to create incentives uh, for the, uh, of, of the financing at low cost a state and local uh, uh, debt. Uh, a, okay, so that the, the device of tax exemption was agreed to. Uh, people have many investment choices, and somebody can take uh, $100,000 and go out and buy AT&T and get 7% uh, bonds or by uh, the municipality of uh, Los Angeles uh, water something or other pay three th and, and get three percent free of taxes That's now he's given up he's That's given up for point to one of the points I was trying to make was that we seem to have to play the political game in order to to be morally corrupt as soon as well, we I don't think I don't think this is a question of politics I think this is a question what do of we do with our money what does governor Reagan now that he's re governor of California what does he do with his money to do to change the tax structure what do we do, for instance, with a Repu why well, does a Republican administration support for money from Las Vegas or accept it willingly? Why, for instance, is there not any change of money, for instance, any money spent on Angela Davis and money spent on William Kelly? I mean, I, to me, I'm just, I agree with you about the tax structure. I agree with you about the past history about it. And I agree with you about how the money's, how, how people can obey the law and escape paying taxes. But the point is, nothing is being done now. I, I feel, I frankly feel guilty, for instance, when I see my black brothers or my Chicanos, and, and I know that they're being screwed, and there's nothing that I can do about it. Why isn't, for instance, there isn't a single Republican candidate speaking out for any of the disadvantaged people or the people who are being oppressed, particularly with a race issue, specifically here on this campus with Angela Davis? And, and to make the comparison to William Cowley, I just, to, me, to me, it just floors me. It floors me that not a single Republican candidate has voiced opposition to President Nixon. And I know that Percy is just waiting to say something. I know that Governor Rockefeller is trying to say something. But everybody's being told to be quiet. Why? No, I, I think that what you're running into is a, a, uh, a judgment as to which two alternatives uh, uh, make sense for this country. And there's nothing sinister. No one's being uh, being uh, uh, throttled or coerced into into making the, going out and going to bat for the for the Nixon administration. This represents their conscious decision that, uh, given the two alternatives facing this country, and the, these, this is the practical here and now, that the Nixon administration is working in the right direction. And I think, incidentally, the Nixon administration has a great record in connection of helping the very people you're talking about in a manner that makes absolute sense. And that is to help with economic opportunity, do away with paternalism and all of these programs that we saw in the great society that have ended up doing very little for, for black Americans, for Chicanos. The important areas to help out is to develop the uh, ability to climb up the economic oh, ladder. There has been more positive Prog progress under the Nixon administration and, and, and the two previous administrations combined in terms of, of, uh, of uh, 
of uh, economic help to uh, uh, to, to businesses, uh, channeling governmental purchases uh, uh, in in these various communities, uh, help with training, all of these things. But that for I every think dollar that's being spent in this field, for every dollar, there's a, a, so many other dollars going in. For instance, for for espionage and police under detective work, and uh, mm -hmm. for instance, as I understand it, UCLA has turned down X number of dollars. For, for riot control and all kinds of modern police weapons. I mean, to me, it seems like for every dollar, yes, it's true that there, there are more women in the federal government. But if you read MS, MS thinks it's, 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 it's just token, tokenism. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. It's uh, uh, very large tokenism. Very large. And I think sincere. Yeah. <laughs> Well, can you make one comment, for instance, about Kelly and Angela Davis? I mean, okay. Uh, I think Angela Davis received a fair trial. I believe there is the evidence there that required her to be indicted, and she is the beneficiary of a system which you would, uh, which go goes as far out uh, to try to protect the interests of the innocent as any any that exists in the earth today. I think she's a prime exhibit number one of the fairness of our of our system of our criminal system. Why was she fired? She's, she's been taken away from a, from a university. Lieutenant Cowley has, has been convicted of a crime, and yet he was given extremely comfortable quarters. If you were to, for instance, to, to have a psychologist or a psychiatrist talk to either one of them, you would find that Lieutenant Cowley is much more at home. He's, he, he feels like he, he's, he's where he wants to be. If you talk to Angela Davis, she's not where she wants to be. She's been taken out of her rightful environment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I think it's kind of ironic that you should come here and uh, tell us that we may not quite have the maturity to make certain judgments, but that most of us worked for you in your campaign. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> touche. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to take issue with the point of. Uh, uh, the fact that Democrats have controlled the Congress during all these uh, tax reform issues, uh, I think you'll find that conservative Democrats and Republicans in many of these at times band together, shall we say, and that either many of the things that people who intend to reform the tax laws uh, are interested in either go by the wayside or else have to be compromised in order to get any kind of reform at all entered into the tax structure. And thirdly, uh, I saw your brother on a TV show recently, and uh, everybody <laughs> oohed and odd like they usually do whenever <laughs> he talks. <laughs> and he said that, uh, that uh, the problem was that the, uh, the three restraints that uh, we usually have, we used to have in the good old days, uh, social and legal, and I believe the other one was moral, no, divine. That's right. I think he was talking about himself, if I wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, uh, mainly, moral, uh, mainly moral and legal restraints have kind of gotten merged, or should we say the social and the legal. And he said that, sure, it's okay to have uh, a liberal obscenity law, but that in the old days, uh, you weren't a very nice man if you uh, still sold what were what we might call dirty books. What I would like to know is, if that's the case, why, even though there are these loopholes, shall we say, why are you such a nice guy if you take all of them? You just said that it was, you know, very legal and everything to take them, but why does everyone take them if they're still not very nice things? Like pornography. Well, you, you're jumping to conclusion that these things are necessarily bad things. I, I don't buy that, frankly. I think a lot of them need, need uh, re revision, a lot of them need uh, re-examination, uh, but I believe that uh, people who are sincerely involved in trying to do the proper thing and uh, uh, to, to have the impact of the tax situation constructive felt that uh, right, uh, well, let's take one that was uh, advocated by uh, uh, President uh, Kennedy, the, uh, the tax credit for uh, for uh, a new investment in plant and equipment, our uh, bill. Now this is one of the ones that uh, George McGovern is talking about. Let's get rid of it. Uh, it's a it's a loophole. Uh, what this 
does, this particular uh, device does, is recognize the fact that to, for the United States economy to be competitive, for it to produce jobs, to produce, produce employment, it's got to be efficient. The way you, you increase your efficiency is, to buy, is by updating the, uh, the, uh, your, um, uh, your whole manufacturing apparatus. Okay, let, let me see. I, so, uh, okay, perhaps okay. I used a bad term in saying that they were all bad things. I'm not saying that every single loophole doesn't have a purpose. Let me say that it, it's... Loophole is one of these words. Okay, so that every kind uh, of moral, uh, whatever you uh, want to, whatever, however you want to phrase yeah. it. Uh, however, it, it does seem that these people who are paying absolutely no taxes and are making a lot of money, and I think, will you recognize that there are people who make a lot of money who don't pay any taxes? Yeah, about six of them, I think. Uh, well, I, I would take issue with that. Um, whatever, you know, that they can see that perhaps they should be paying some tax and that maybe it isn't right to take every single kind of write-off which is available to them. Which, the same was the way that which was the consensus of the Congress a couple of years ago, hence the uh, 1970, I think it was the 1970 law, which now requires a minimum tax irrespective of whether or not under different provisions of the Internal Revenue Law you, uh, uh, you have no tax due. You are aware of that. Touche, as you say. One more question on the um, on the Watergate. Uh, I, I believe your brother refers to it as a caper. I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, I think it's okay. Uh, I think that makes it a um, prank. Okay. What I was wondering is, like, for example, Senator Goldwater is very quick to write this off and say that you know that's this is something that's all happened before, but I think that we can see that something like this has not really happened before, that there is some evidence that there was uh, sabotage involved in some of these campaigns, and that there are people missing, actually missing, a, a gentleman named Sal Maggi or something like that, uh, can't be, okay, Segretti, cannot be found. Uh, do you have any, uh, do you know where he is? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, as a conservative, I've been having trouble with the last in the last couple of years uh, reconciling what I see to uh, be between my political principles heretofore held uh, to and uh, dealing with the increasing awareness of the manifestations of population density and uh, population pressure and just the absolute absolute amount of numbers of people on the face of the earth. Would you comment, please? Yeah. Uh, I think we, we've got a very, very serious and real problem, and it is a more of a real problem in other parts of the world than it is in the United States. By any uh, indicia of Western Europe, we're underpopulated, and I'd like to see us that way, uh, continue that way. Now, the then the question is, what do you? And, and incidentally, it's not so much a question of population in the country as density of population and the ability to handle the wastes of human activities. Uh, there's fewer fewer continents as unpopulated uh, as Australia, yet uh, Sydney, Australia, has very very acute uh, pollution problems. Uh, now. What do you do about, uh, about uh, growth in population? Uh, I think education. Uh, it's a thing that people can will to control. In, and uh, in point of fact, as a result of the enormous amount of education that's going on in this country, we see that we are, in fact, uh, right on the verge of uh, population zero. Uh, we, uh, uh, and each time somebody projects what the population of the United States is going to be in the year 19, uh, 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 or the year 2000, we've dropped 20 or 30 millions. Uh, one phenomenon that has been lost sight of, and is one that I was conscious of when I was growing up, was that in Western Europe in the late 1930s, there was enormous concern because populations were declining. And this was before the pill, before all kinds of other things. But there was something in the, uh, the will to family formation, uh, what was desired, what was consider considered socially uh, acceptable, or the other pressures, uh, financial pressures on raising a family, which caused a shrinkage in, in, uh, in fertility. Uh, so I think it's a question that can be 
uh, handled. I think it's a question which we are coming to grips with in this country, and I think it can be handled in a manner that is consistent with the beliefs of all elements of our population. I'm worried about the side factor. Well, uh, the, you, right now, the people who are getting married are having pretty close to those two children that we s see in all those lovely posters. Uh, now, the, the one thing we can do in terms of time factor is either euthanasia, which I would uh, uh, discount, or a moratorium on babies, which I think uh, uh, people wouldn't cooperate with. <laughs> Uh, I'm told that we have qu time for two short questions. I have been waiting. Mr. The question was, where did I stand on the abortion appeal in New York? Uh, this I'll give you a very short answer because there's no way of giving a, an in-between sized answer on this one. I personally I do not favor abortion on demand. Mr. Mr. Buckley? Buckley? Over here. Sir. Mr. Buckley, given the nature <laughs> of American th America's theory of defense of being a... I, I, sorry, I didn't given the nature of America's defense theory, in other words, that we uh, will keep, we will, um, <laughs> keep a, a uh, position of being able to destroy anybody who would attempt to destroy us, uh, how would you reconcile or is there a reconciliation of, of uh, President Nixon's policy of saying that we will never be number two in defense capabilities when that type of statement in no way coincides with the policy we uh, maintain and he knows it and he's also said that as Senator McGovern said he would cut down our defense spending he said that Senator McGovern's proposals would not only cut away fat, but would cut away muscle. In that statement, he admitted that there was fat in the budget, in the military budget. Where would he cut? Why does he make a statement which goes against his own, the policy that he knows of? And uh, why does he mislead the people to think that to, um, to, be number, to be safe in our country, we have to have the most number of missiles, the most number of airplanes, the most number of everything else, when he knows that we have what is important is our destructive power, which we have a, four to one, a projected four-to-one edge over uh, Russia. First of all, I'll point out that uh, he just signed an agreement which, for the next five years, cuts us below uh, parity in terms of, of uh, missiles and, and nuclear launching submarines. Uh, the, the policy that you're talking about is a strategic weapons policy, assured destruction, and the, the whole concept being that we will be able to absorb a first nuclear strike and still return enough uh, 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 devastation to, uh, to, to obliterate the attacking country, and therefore we have this balance of terror that uh, preserves the, uh, keeps, a safe, safe, uh, keeps us from uh, ever having that uh, nuclear holocaust. But there are all kinds of other dimensions of, uh, of warfare, of threat. And uh, the president, uh, two or three years ago, uh, pleaded to the Congress to give him a greater flexibility than this business of, of obliterating entire cities. As we have, as a matter of national policy, refused to give ourselves that ultimate accuracy that would enable us to go after military installations or, or silos as opposed to populations and industrial masses. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's, there's anything inconsistent in saying that, yes, our strategic uh, 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 posture ultimately depends on the assured uh, of a capacity to wipe out another country. But then, if there is a nuclear standoff, uh, we need to have parity, or be second to none, in terms of the conventional forces and in terms of tactical nuclear weapons in order to meet the sort of situation that co we could have in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Middle East. The plausibility of America's uh, 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 mutual security agreements with NATO, for example, and others, uh, presupposes that the United States will be able to f function effectively in a situation which is less than apocalyptic. 
that was uh, that the uh, conventional, the conventional, um, <coughs> keeping our conventional forces to that point where that they could be used as a effective uh, instruments of foreign policy was something that started under Kennedy. But um, when you said uh, they just signed those agreements with the SALT talks, which we reduced our numbers of uh, missiles and uh, submarines. But the fact is, uh, we, and our, our MIRV capability is such that we have a four to one destructive power. We presently so have a projected, that, uh, thru projected we through the agreement. Yeah, we present actually, in, in, uh, we presently have closer to parity uh, uh, than, 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 four to, than the four to one. That four to one involves all kinds of advanced bombers and so on, and uh, other things that have to be reloaded and reloaded, which can't be launched all at one time. But uh, there isn't a single analyst of, of repute that I know of that doesn't feel that at the, at the end of this five-year interim period that the Russians will have achieved that same nerve capacity, at which case their, uh, their thrust, th their throw weight power will enable them to translate uh, the figures in the other direction towards the United States. Excuse me, this, we're, we're going into several questions, which I'll be happy to do, but I'm told that... Uh, okay. Well, should we have one more question? Because I gave... The, yours didn't count, really. Because I didn't count. <laughs> The question was, uh, the, the, said the Senator Bai said there was a chance that the Republicans would get control. Small chance. Uh, what did I think? I think that if we have uh, a, a very large Nixon vote, a, say 60 percent plus, that there is a good chance that uh, enough Republicans would be brought in to change the control of, of the Senate. There are all kinds of marginal uh, races in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, which are hanging on a thread. And, and I think whether or not uh, it will tip into the Republican uh, side will depend in large measure on the size of the presidential vote. How about the yeah. 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 Uh, Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you all. <laughs>